I want to start by following up some of the things that were brought up in those wonderful talks from our panelists. And perhaps going first to David, to talk about the question of how we see the world, the problem being psychological, that our view of the world is that of a predator. We're looking at the world as something where we want to, you know, take everything from it. Thinking about how we would change that, we're in a situation where more and more people live in cities and that number is increasing all the time. The kind of things that you mentioned about your family have strong parallels in a country like Australia. People who are cut off from the generations who often pass on that kind of knowledge. Um, people see less and less of the natural world except in those kind of nice, tidy pieces. They love animals. They love, you know, their pet. They love something that they see at the zoo, but they're not actually seeing a whole picture because they're really quite disconnected mm -hmm. from it. How can we change that? Well, it's a, it's a big challenge. Uh, there's a double challenge. One is the incredible move to cities mm -hmm. in Canada as in Australia. Uh, over 80% of us now live in big cities in Canada. And I, I tell the story of a friend of mine that lives in the northern part of Toronto, Canada's biggest city, in a high-rise apartment, completely air-conditioned. He, he told me in the morning he goes down the basement into his air-conditioned car, mm -hmm. drives down the freeway into the basement of his air-conditioned uh, commercial building, which is connected through tunnels to huge shopping centers. And he said, you know, I don't have to go outside for weeks. And when you live that way, it's very easy to see why, for him, his highest priority in the city is his job. You need a job to earn the money to buy the things you want. And so the economy then, in his mind, becomes the, the dominant issue. So how do we reconnect people back? You know, the other thing is that we're being, Canada believes because of the uh, similarity in the curves of the economic growth and population growth, Canadians aren't replacing themselves. So we're hyping our population by immigration. The immigrants that come in, their first priority is like my grandparents. They want security, they work mm. like mad. And so we've really got a, a program now of trying to take uh, children of, of new immigrants out into nature. Uh, we have the other problem in Canada that our national parks, the attendance is dropping like mad. And the reason is nobody wants to go overnight without Wi-Fi. <laughs> and so, you know, we've got all these pressures that are resulting in less and less of our, our contact with nature. And that is a very, very big challenge. Yeah. I mean, I think it, some, those of us who are fortunate enough to live in Sydney can understand why somebody living in Canada might see nature as hostile in some ways, that, that something to protect yourself from. In Canada? From. But those of us who were... Wait, I thought in just, Australia, the my States God. Spiders. <laughs> <laughs> jellyfish, spiders. I, right. I was forgetting about <laughs> the spiders. Killer jellyfish, yeah. You can tell for this, you know, Sydney resident person that the sub-zero temperatures are loom more, you know, higher than any, any redback spider. <laughs> and, and so, David, do you think this is something which is, it's about working, you know, really trying to work with a, a subsequent, you know, young, people who are young now, where there can be a program of education, that those of us who have grown up in a, in a different mindset, it's, it's really something that it's too late to change? Well, I think all, all things ca can change, uh, but I think the schools are doing a, a good job of getting kids at least environmentally concerned. They know to turn mm. out the lights and turn off the taps when they're brushing their teeth and all of those simple things, but we're not, I think the challenge is to see the interconnections. When I got to, to Melbourne two days ago, we, we took three taxis, and each time I asked uh, the taxi driver, where do you get your electricity? Mm. And none of them knew. I mean, the first one was, well, the electric company. <laughs> but they just never really thought about it. And, and that's the way it is, that we live in a world in which we don't see the interconnectivity and therefore we don't see why nature matters to us. In Toronto, I, I love talking to kids because I say, okay, so when you turn on the tap, do you know where the water comes from? They don't know. It comes from Lake Ontario. And then I say, when you flush the toilet, where does it go? They don't know. I say, it goes out to Lake Ontario. <laughs> so then they begin to get the idea of 
<laughs> the interconnection of everything. But that's what we need to do is reconnect the world back together again. Yeah. Um, Naomi, I want to pick up a couple of things that you talked about. Um, from the collapse of Western civilization, perhaps, you talked about how we need to have faith in science and the process and the method. But in the collapse of Western civilization, you make some criticisms of, of, of scientists, not personally, but of the way they are working within that system, that they are too afraid of constructing a hypothesis and believing in something that will turn out not to exist, that they're too stuck in narrow disciplinary boundaries. Tell, can you talk a little bit about how those problems in your scenario of the future, those problems have, have, have had, an, had an impact? Sure. So when Eric Kamen and I were writing Merchants of Doubt, one of the things we were really mindful about was that we didn't really want, we didn't want to criticize the scientific community because we really saw the scientific community as being victims of an organized disinformation campaign. And we really wanted to keep the focus on the big picture, the main story, which was attacks on science by, uh, you know, terrible people. <laughs> but, um, but at the same time, as we were doing the work, we also became aware of things the scientific community did that, that seemed not as helpful as it could have been. And two things that became really clear to us, one is related to what David was just saying about the connections. The way modern science has been constructed is in a very balkanized, very siloized way. So David was trained as a geneticist. Tim was trained as a mammologist. I mean, they're not even both biologists, right? They're different kinds of biologists. And I was trained as a geologist. And you could go to university and study physics or chemistry. And you could study chemistry and not know how old the Earth was. You could study genetics and actually not know a lot about evolution. That's changed. But in the 60s, I mean, and we know this because we studied this at UCSD, um, you could be a physicist and know nothing about the interconnection of life. And, and we see this in some of the extraordinary things that sometimes physicists and chemists say. I mean, I get weird email all the time from physicists, you know. So, um, so one of the points we try to bring out in the collapse of Western civilization is that to address the problem of climate change, we have to look at the interconnections. Climate change is not just a question of atmospheric physics or atmospheric chemistry. It's a question of oceanography and meteorology and plant biology. I mean, there are so many interconnected pieces. The biosphere takes up carbon dioxide. Uh, the oceans take up carbon dioxide. And to some extent, the uptake of carbon dioxide by the oceans is a good thing because it slows the warming of the planet. But it, to some extent, it's a bad thing because it leads to ocean acidification. So these are very complex things. And to really understand climate change as a system, much less to think about its impacts on people, requires really understanding a huge range of different sciences. And I think one of the reasons scientists have had trouble communicating about climate change is because of this. You're an atmospheric physicist. You really understand how the physics of radiative transfer works. And you're really smart, and you're really good at what you do. And someone asks you about ocean acidification, and you don't know what to say. And I think some of, you know, some of what I would call the bad geoengineering proposals, I mean, there are a lot of people smart people, people with PhDs, who are advocating solar radiation management, putting particles in space to block the sun as a solution to climate change. Well, there are a lot of things we could say about that proposal that are potentially problematic, but the most obvious one is that even if it worked to block the sun, it doesn't solve the problem of ocean acidification. And you say that to a physicist who's an advocate of this, and they don't, they're just like dumbfounded. They have no answer. So we tried to make the point that if we're going to solve this problem, we have to think differently as scientists. And we have to be willing to spend more time thinking about the interconnections. And that might mean that maybe we have to give up a little bit you know, of our expertise in one area in order to understand the interconnections with other areas. It's very interesting because I think you, you know, this is something that people who work in these areas encounter all the time, that, and certainly in Australia, the system of research funding, the system of the way universities work still very much prioritises disciplinary purity over kind of breadth. And exactly. you know, people are still sitting in situations where they are thought to be strange if they, if they can really come to terms with more than one, one area of knowledge. I mean, of course, what we have here is an example of three 
uh, scientists who have, you know, f from early in their careers, refused to be bounded by that kind of, you know, narrow view of the world. Tim, can we talk a little bit about those kind of scientific potential, you know, solutions to climate change, to look at what the difference is between some of these proposals like geoengineering and some of the things that you talk about in Atmosphere of Hope as much more positive. And for those of us who are not informed about all aspects of science is how do we look at which science is potentially positive and which is something to be more wary of? Sure. Well, look, look until recently, I think, <coughs> and, and Naomi, you probably agree, that, that these, these ideas of managing the Earth's system to draw CO2 out of the atmosphere or to mitigate some aspect of climate change have been under that really broad rubric of geoengineering, you know. Um, and that's been kind of unhelpful, and it was really the, the publication, probably in the middle of last year, by the Joint Academies, US Academies, of, of science, engineering, and social sciences to try to pick apart this a little bit. And so there's actually two big and diff very different sorts of projects here. Um, one of them you might want to call you know, al albedo modification and conventional geoengineering, and the other is, is a whole group of biological drawdown approaches that, that could be used. And I think that's a really good start. Um, in, in my book, I, I've taken it a little bit further. I've said that you know, we need to ta this has to be immensely practical. We need to dis discriminate between those projects which threaten to have serious side effects, bad side effects, or that don't address the problem directly, put those to one side as not being prioritised, and then look at the remaining basket, which may include projects that potentially have some downsides, but we don't know enough about them yet, and to work, work through them. Um, <clears throat> and just for those in the audience who don't really understand about this albedo modification business, you know, the, the, the idea is that we can put sulphur up into the stratosphere, maybe by putting sulphur in jet fuel or something like that, so getting it up there pretty cheaply, putting a lot of sulphur into the, into the stratosphere and cooling the planet. The sulphur reflects sunlight back into space, so it will actually cool Earth. We know that for sure. But it's sort of like a Band-Aid on a festering sore. You know, the, the greenhouse gases are just going to keep on building up underneath. They're going to keep acidifying the ocean. And if you ever disrupt that, that um, sulphur screen, you can potentially have a really bad rebound, a, a bad, um, bad consequences. The, Albedo modification scares the hell out of me because it's cheap, it's immediately effective. Probably there's a few wealthy individuals who probably live within 10 kilometres of where you are, Naomi, in the US who could afford to do it single-handedly. You know, they could change the climate of the planet. Um, and there's no regulation, there's no global treaty dealing with it. So as we, if we start to get into serious destabilisation of Earth's climate, you know, what's to stop the Chinese doing this, you know, or anyone else? And it will have very severe knock-on consequences, we know. So, for example, if the Chinese decided to do it, the, it it's very likely the climate modelling tells us that the South Asian monsoon will be in, disrupted. 1.4 billion people, you know, disadvantaged or maybe left starving as a result of this. So those sort of projects, I really think we've got to put to one, to one side and have a treaty to say we won't, we won't do this. But there's a whole lot of other things from carbon negative concretes to, you know, plastics from CO2 to seaweed farming and so forth that are really worth following, and I, I call those, th that approach really the third way. It's not geoengineering, it's not abatement, emissions abatement, but it is another way, and a very, it's a way that'll work at the gigaton scale to deal with this problem, and I, I think that that is where we need to put the majority of our investment. Do you think that policy makers are thinking about it in this way? No, I, I mean, I had to invent this term, the third way, you know, this is all incredibly new. No one's really thinking about geoengineering much, you know. And very few people Apart have realised... Apart from the geoengineers. Yeah, <laughs> it's right. Very few people have acknowledged the fact that it is now too late to stop at one and a half degrees. The gas is already in the air to take us to one and a half degrees. Um, but, you know, we need to actually absorb that and understand that, not as a message of doom, but as a challenge, another challenge. And that challenge means we've got to get the gas out of the air. If we look at this... Um, it, it, you know, if we step back from these particular things and look at this whole question about what is there to be optimistic and hopeful about and what is the importance of that? I mean, it, it's been very, very interesting for me in the last couple of years working here at the Opera House and putting on talks 
on various environmental topics. And it's very interesting to see how audiences respond to different things, that there are some things that people don't want to hear about, and there are some things, you know, as evidence tonight, that they do. And one of the key things about the way what people um, will really engage with is something where there is a message of hope. If you talk to people, you know, of course we know that th theoretically we're concentrating for potentially for evolutionary reasons more on the bad news because that's what's going to save our life. But in a way, psychologically, people want to see that there's something solvable um, and want to see that there's hope and something in particular where, where they can do something. What do you think we have to be hopeful about? Well, I think there's a lot of things, and I think one of them, paradoxically, is actually cities. So I totally agree with David, and on the one hand, we do need to make sure that people are connected with nature and that they understand our dependency on nature, and also that people experience the amazing beauty and spiritual replenishment that we get when we spend time in nature with animals. Um, in fact, in Collapse of Western Civilization, there's a bit in the story where pets begin to die. And the thing about that book that made the right wing most insane was they said, Naomi Oreskes wants to kill all the pets and dogs, cats and dogs in America. <laughs> like, um, anyway, um, I also kill a lot of Australians. My Australian friends got a little upset about that too. But um, <laughs> there, I have to tell you, for those who haven't read it, there's a very, there's a, it's a small, it's like a sentence that says, talks about areas where populations have regenerated after the great collapse. And it says, just one line, Populations in Africa and Australia didn't really manage to, you know, come back in any way. Well, and my, my mother calls me up, she goes, Naomi, how could you do that to your friends in Australia? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, Mom, it's a novel. <laughs> um, <laughs> but the fact is, actually, cities are a tremendous grounds for hope. Because, for the very reason that you just said, because the vast majority of us live in cities now, and almost all of the demographic projections show that most of the population growth in the next 30 years will be in cities. And this is actually a huge opportunity because cities are actually more energy efficient than country towns and rural areas, which means that with proper urban planning and energy efficiency, we actually have tremendous opportunity for energy savings in urban areas. So that's actually, and the other thing is politically, um, we all know, you know, you talked about the Abbott, Harper, Bush axis of evil. And, you know, we all know that changing policy on the federal level in most countries is very difficult. And the bigger the country, often the more difficult it is. But changing policies on the level of the town or city or even the province or state that you live in is much easier. In the United States, we have over a thousand cities that have now committed to the Kyoto Protocol. Now, when that first happened, I remember thinking, well, that's very nice. You know, all these towns and cities will say, oh, we believe in Kyoto, but it doesn't really mean anything. But actually, I realize now I was wrong to think that. It means a huge amount, because these cities are now taking steps to make their uh, infrastructure more efficient, to have um, building codes, to make buildings more efficient. And there are huge energy savings that are starting to happen all across America in places like <coughs> Seattle, you know, from New York to Seattle to the small towns like where I live in Carlisle, Massachusetts, we had a program called Solarize. Uh, Carlisle, 80% of our people now have at least some solar energy. Um, and we have a solar energy swap program now that if I generate more energy than I can use, I can s sell it or give it to a neighbor. So, I mean, a lot of amazing things are happening in cities. And that's a kind of combination of good politics that's responsive to local needs, and the fact that there are very real things that you can do. And then the third thing is technology. I think the most important grounds for optimism right now is that when it comes to the energy part of this puzzle, so not about the CO2 that is in the atmosphere, but about the CO2 we don't want to add, the technologies we need to become 100% renewable energy already exist now. And there are a number of very excellent scientific and technical studies that have been done just in the last five years or so that show this. We don't have to, we don't need a miracle, we don't need some like magic trick, we don't need some breakthrough technology that only exists in science fiction. All of these technologies exist now. And that means that we just need the right regulatory structures, the right policies, and the right investment, you talked about the investment banks, to bring those technologies into operation. And that can be done on the level of towns and cities 
even if the federal government refuses to act. There's no question we're in, it's the change. It's happening, yeah. yeah. We're in the middle of it now. Because we're deeply in, embedded in it, it's hard to tell what's actually going on. It'll be history that will inform us. But I don't think there's any, any question. The problem is just the scale of the change that's needed and the speed with which it's got to be done. Now, you know, the, the problem is very simple. We're, we're loading the atmosphere with too much carbon dioxide. The solution is very simple. Stop loading it, uh, stop loading it up and uh, let's get on with finding ways to, to, to pull it out if, if that's possible. Lots of low-hanging fruit, the easy stuff, and one, you know, efficiency is, is a way to save money. And, but I think the really important thing is that we have to grasp the challenge that it is very real. When Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, Americans didn't go, oh my God, they destroyed the Pacific Fleet. It's gonna cost too much for us to do anything about it. <laughs> you know, like you, when the crisis is there, you do it. I was uh, in my last year in college in the United States uh, uh, in 1957, and on October 4th, we were shocked when the Soviet Union launched Sputnik. And I didn't even know there was a space program. And in the months that followed, the American Armed Forces, the Army, Navy, and, and Air Force, each had their own rockets and tried to launch their own satellites, and everyone blew up on the launch pad. Meanwhile, the Russians launched the first animal in space, a dog, Laika, the first man, Yuri Gagarin, first team of cosmonauts, the first spacewalk, the first woman, Valentina Tereshkova. Americans didn't say, oh my God, we can't afford to catch up, like, this is crazy, they're too far. They just said, we got to do something. And, and in 1961, Kennedy announced the big plan, we're going to get humans to the moon and back within a decade. And the commitment was made. And, you know, here I was, a foreigner living in the States, and all you had to do was say, I like science. They threw money at you. It was just a <laughs> glorious period. You know, and, and look at what happened as a result of that commitment. The, the Americans are the only ones to get to the moon and back. But every year when Nobel Prizes are announced, who gets still a significant proportion of those Nobel Prizes? They're Americans because Americans made that commitment and built a scientific community that still reaps the benefits of that. And you think of the uh, unexpected... Uh, when Kennedy announced a program to get to the moon, he didn't have a clue. Nobody knew how they would do it. He just said, we got to do it. And out of that came all kinds of totally unexpected benefits, spin-offs. In fact, there's a magazine that comes out every year called Spin-offs, and there are hundreds of unexpected things that result from laptops to GPS to cell phones to ear thermometers to space blankets. Nobody anticipated these things would come out of it. The really important thing is make the commitment. And then all kinds of things are going to happen. And you begin with the low-hanging fruit, and it's true. Cities are where the action is. I mean, what, what is, is it Clover? Your, yes, your Clover Mall. I met with, with the mayor here a few years ago, and I was blown away. What Sydney is doing is absolutely fantastic. And it's not about climate change, it's about making the city a more livable place. And benefits come out of that. So the, the opportunities are huge and cities are leading the charge on that, I think. Mm. Mm. We've touched on something here, both about the things to be optimistic about, but also some of the counterweights to that. Um, you know, we've talked about the energy system having a lot of inertia. That's not the only thing that has a lot of inertia. And uh, if we look at the, our political processes, and in particular, the range of vested interests and their influence on those political processes. So let's talk about politics for a while. And, uh, you know, David's given us an example of, and, and Naomi talking about sub-national governments really responding to this issue in quite an important way. Tim, talk to us about politics. Right. <laughs> How much time have you talk got? Talk to us about, yes. about the, you know, the failures of politics to come to terms with this, because this is something that I think you've experienced very directly. Well, I, I have seen it pretty close up, and I, look, I, I must say, I, I really think that there are fundamental flaws in the 
the system of representation that we live with today. And, you know, <laughs> I mean, it, the idea that you can, you know, appoint someone as your representative and, and, and then say, so you go away and do your thing and come back three years later, you wouldn't do that with your business, you know, but that's only the very beginning of the problem. I mean, how, does, how do you get the selection committee up? You know, the political parties, these incredibly obscure things that who knows how they work, but, you know, every, every smell around them seems wrong, you know, there's something... <laughs> Definitely not right about the way that selection process works, right? And the, the revolving door, you know, into a business that supports a party and back out. And it just, you know, it, it, it beggars belief. And when you see the outcome, I mean, I, who didn't fall off their seat when they um, um, heard the news that Bronwyn Bishop had a helicopter waiting for five hours at, at Melbourne Airport to take her down to a Liberal Party fundraiser, to fly over all those poor electors down below and wave to them, perhaps, as she went over? Um, I mean, it, it's just so broken, I think. It, it, it is. It, it's now become careers for people. I think the statistics in Australia are that if your parent was a politician, you're more than 500 times more likely to become one. And it's become an intergenerational thing. I mean, what, whatever happened to the idea of public service? That, you know, decent, upright members of the community would, would give three years of their life, you know? Yeah. Um, I, just to say, I'll, I'll do one term. You know, I'll do one term. It's a very important question, and it's certainly what you say is backed up entirely by um, information from surveys on what um, Australian electors think of politics and politicians. Mm -hmm. The level of trust in federal government is extremely low and has declined rapidly. And, and quite rightly so. Mm. But could I just say, I think that there's something... <laughs> There's something kind of special about politics, right? It's the one area of our life where Adam Smith's idea of the division of labour doesn't really work. Everywhere else you can have specialists, you know, specialist doctors and you know, scientists and butchers or whatever, and you get a better outcome. But politics is the one area, I think, where everyone has to be part of it. You can't have elected representatives who spend a, life being, a lifetime as your elected representative because power corrupts. And what we need is a whole lot of people who represent the community, maybe for shorter periods of time over smaller issues, something like citizen juries, you know, um, some combination of that and, and the, the, the people who will the, those represent the society for three years in, in Parliament. We all need to be part of it. It's not something you can leave to other people to do, I think. Well, of course, we have on our panel somebody who's looking down the barrel of an election later this year. <laughs> David, who's... Uh, got a new Prime Minister who's posing for irresistible photos with pandas. <laughs> <laughs> so we're all in very different situations, I think. But this, this fundamental issue about trust in government to deal with this important issue is an interesting one. Naomi, in your version of the future in the collapse of Western civilization, there's a very interesting part towards the end where you talk about the way governments have responded to the crisis. And the fact, for example, that you talk about the example of what's happened in Florida, which has disappeared, and you contrast that with the example of what happened in China, where a central government, centralised authoritarian government, was able to move extremely quickly and transplant people, rebuild cities, and how this you know, proved to be really an advertisement for the benefits of heavily centralised and undemocratic government. Could you tell us a little bit about why you saw that as an important part of a potential future. Sure. Well, it's, it's really the most important part of the book, and so this is at the risk of kind of spoiler alert, but the book is sufficiently depressing that you'll enjoy reading it anyway. Um, <laughs> and anyway, you know how it ends, so it doesn't really matter if we give away the ending. Um, when Eric Conway and I were writing Merchants of Dow, this was a story that had many, many ironies, but one of the most profound ironies we felt was that part of the story there was that the people who were denying the reality of climate change, who were being dismissive of the science, rejecting the science, thought that they were defending democracy and thought that they were protecting personal freedom and liberty because they feared that climate change would be used as an excuse to expand the reach of government, increase, you know, they didn't use the phrase nanny state, but they could have, um, and that we would lose our personal freedoms and we would end up with sort of communism by the back door. And this anxiety about a sort of slippery slope to communism, a back door to socialism, really animates, animated the main characters in Merchants of Doubt and still animates a lot of climate change denial in the United States today. And Eric and I thought, we had a very 
long conversation one evening. We said, this is so ironic, because you know what's going to happen? If we don't address climate change, that's what's going to lead to totalitarianism. Mm -hmm. Because just think about it for a moment. Think about a natural disaster. You know, when do we all say it's fine to call out the military? When do we say it's fine to call out the National Guard? In the, in the face of a national disaster. We send in troops because we have to, because there's an emergency situation. And all kinds of civil liberties get suspended and all kinds of personal freedoms go out the window when we have a crisis. So now imagine a world in which climate crisis becomes the norm, in which we have devastating cy cyclones and typhoons and floods. I and mean, think about those Queensland floods that you had here a few years ago. Imagine if that starts happening all the time and meanwhile, there are bushfires in the west, there's floods in the northeast, there's sea level rise here in Sydney, and now we're in a kind of state of perpetual natural disaster. Well, that's a recipe for totalitarianism. That's an invitation to totalitarianism. So anyone who cares about democracy and personal freedom and liberty ought to be doing everything in their power to take climate change seriously and to act on it now before it actually does become too late for liberal democracies to, to solve the problem. Mm. There are still some very big issues to be discussed. We haven't even got on to the economy. Um, <laughs> but I'm going to ask you for your input. Please, if you have a question, there are microphones here down, down in the, the aisles on the sides of the auditorium. There are two microphones uh, up, up there, one on each side. So if you have something to ask any or all of our panel, um, please make your way to a microphone and we'll, we'll try and take as many as you can. I was at this discussion last night at the Wheeler Centre and witnessed Michael Williams, the Wheeler Centre's director, being very, very tough, <laughs> saying, you know what a question is? Something short that has an answer. And a question. So, um, <laughs> or words to that effect. So I would encourage you to remember that, um, that, that the more uh, precisely and concisely you can express your question, the more people will be able to hear from and, uh, and bring to our wonderful panellists. So we'll start here with microphone number one, please, down here. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. When I was 20, I read Wisdom of the Elders, which is my favourite book. And now I'm a, lot, a little bit older with teenagers, and I teach teenagers. And I'm just curious what your message to teenagers might be about stewardship for the environment when they're living in a Kardashian world. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, I try, to, uh, I try to show the interconnection of everything and... Uh, and our interdependence on the whole thing. I really believe if we, we will fight to protect what we love. If we don't love it, we're just, we don't have an investment in it. And so uh, this is a, a major part of what I try to do with teenagers. But I, you know, I, my parents got married during the Great Depression. And the Depression was a very tough time and that really shaped them in many ways. So that when I was growing up, they banged home the messages which was live within your means, save some for tomorrow, share, don't be greedy. You have to work hard to, to buy the things you need, not the things you want, the things you need. But have, you don't run after money as if having more money makes you a more important, better person. Those are messages that were part of my upbringing, but we see, they seem so irrelevant today. I, I try to tell them that Disposable is a, is a bad word. If, you know, someone says, oh, I'll use the disposable, I cover their ears and say, that person just said a nasty word. That's, that's terrible. I usually say, that asshole just used a very nasty word. But, uh, you know, I, when I get into clothing fashions, I just go nuts. I mean, when I was a boy, my parents bought me a jacket, a coat, and I very quickly outgrew it, so it was passed to my sister, who then outgrew it, and, and it was passed on. And I remember my parents boasting that that coat went through three kids. I mean, can you imagine a kid today that would, would take a hand-me-down from a sibling and then boast about what a great uh, uh, coat it was? I mean, the ultimate thing that makes me so 
angry is to see people buying new pants deliberately cut with holes <laughs> in it. It makes no sense to me at all. I mean, this is, this is crazy. So. Thank you. Sorry, I haven't answered your question. <laughs> No, but we've had a great time. Microphone number two up, the, up here. David, I'll top your story. My first bicycle had gone through five people. <laughs> and it was a girl's bike. Uh, my question, I think it's clear from this audience that you are talking to the converted, and most of us would agree that climate change is not crap. The scientist that is missing from this panel is the science, the dark science of economics. Mm. What are the economists doing about working out how we can live in a world that cannot continue to grow? Who's going to tell that oil patch chief executive that it's okay if his business doesn't get bigger? Mm. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, I, I'll, let me just give you a little bit. First of all, economics is not a science. <laughs> I agree. It's a set of beliefs posing as a science. And one of the problems with this human construct is that there are, for me, two big problems with it. One is that nature and the services nature performs are not a part of that economic system. They're considered externalities. So trees, for example, take carbon out of the air, put oxygen back in it. Economists ignore that as anything they have to worry about. Uh, nature is performing all kinds of things that make the planet habitable for us, but they're not in the economic uh, construct. But the other thing that is absolutely insane is that the, we have come to believe that growth is the be-all and end-all, the very objective of, of uh, economics or the economy is to be kept growing. And we forget that the economy is a means to something else. But we've made the economy the end. It's, we're all there to serve the economy to pe keep it growing. And we don't ask the important questions. What's an economy for? How much is enough? Can it continue to grow indefinitely? Uh, I was just in, in Japan a few weeks ago and I keep saying, you should be the poster, poster country uh, that should brag about the fact that you've had a static economy for 20 years now. And things didn't go to hell in a handbasket. I mean, the country looks pretty fine to me. So what's all this stuff about? We've got to have more. We've got to keep it growing. This is madness. It's suicidal. Sorry, that was a short answer. <laughs> Jim. I think, yeah. There was a very interesting aspect of your question, which you mentioned oil companies and, and what's going to happen uh, with, 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 with oil, for example, as you know, growth flattens. And we're seeing it right now, and I'm quite intrigued with, say, looking at a company like ExxonMobil over the last decade. Um, it, it, the way that those companies work is to... They've, they've gone for larger and larger reserves of, of oil in harder to get at places like the Gulf of Mexico, deep water or, or the Arctic Ocean or whatever. Tar so the, yeah, the tar sand. So the cost of retrieval has just gone up and up and up. So you know, the, the forward costs of a lot of that oil is up above $100 a barrel. It's, it's really, really high. And to put in the trillions of dollars of investment you need to unlock that oil, it takes many, many years, you know, decades from, from start to the point when you get some oil flow and capital coming back. Um, and, and a vast amount of capital. And that demands really rapid growth in the market. You see it. And so just the slowing demand for oil that we've got at the moment and the, the price competition from things like fracking in the US, shale fracking in the US, are having a massive impact. So, you know, we've seen the biggest oil boom in recent decades over the last five or six years. ExxonMobil and the other majors have lost billions and billions and billions of dollars. I think your question's being answered right now by the market, that the, big, that the strategy that the oil companies are following is, is, is a really, really high-risk one that's just incompatible even with moderate rates of growth, much less a declining demand, which is very likely, I think, in future as electric vehicles uh, start, to, start to cut in. So we live, we'll be living in a different world, I think, a decade from now, and your question will really be answered for a big sector of the industry. I think the answer is they collapse. 
You know? it's, it's funny, one of the things about renewable energy is that we can generate it pretty much anywhere, given the technologies that we've, we've got now. Um, so it's a less tradable commodity. Oil's highly tradable. You, know, you get in a few patches and you ship it around the world. Um, but we're moving into a world where trade just isn't going to look like that. And I think it's a really fascinating, uh, fascinating question uh, that's kind of probably going to presage bigger shifts in the economy overall. It'll be very, very interesting to see. Mm. From, a question from microphone number three. Thank you. Up the back. Uh, Rhonda Daly, fourth generation farmer, biological farming uh, educator as well. It is known that the soils are the second largest sink to sequester carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Yet it was only David tonight that spoke about the importance of air, water and soil uh, for the importance of civilization as we know it uh, today. However, why are we not educating the world more of the importance of regenerating soils to act as a carbon sink and for the production of healthy, nutritious food in a natural way? Yeah. You're throw it to me. Okay. <laughs> yeah, no, it's good. Look, I think that you're right that the soils are a massive potential sink for carbon. And there has been a reasonable amount of work done um, in Australia and globally on how you might enhance uh, carbon in soils. I talk about it a bit in my book, I just didn't have time to get onto it tonight. But things like rotational grazing, you know, cell grazing uh, in pastoral lands, the use of biochar, uh, more natural methods, zero-till, zero-kill approaches to, to agriculture. And they all do have the potential to start sequestering carbon at large scale. I think what we've, what we've lacked to date, though, is uh, data on long-term sequestration rates for a lot of these technologies. I know there's some work coming out in Australia, from Australia, hopefully in the next few months, looking at biochar in soils over the moderately long term, because people have been sequestering it in Australia for now a couple of decades, so there's some data coming out. But it's another one of those approaches, much like the things I was talking about earlier this evening, where we've got, we can see the potential, we understand it's important, but we don't have the full understanding of the systems yet to see at what scale uh, and using what interventions we can sequester how much carbon. Can we but it is incredibly is important. Sorry. Can we see that as a new technology that's going to get... I was part of the carbon reference group that got the first methodology together mm. um, to sequester carbon and, and farmers to be paid for it. However, these other new technologies are uh, like they're liberating more money rather than the soil, which is our second largest sink and our biggest potential to sequester the carbon. It seems that the new technologies are going to halt the production of carbon, whereas the soils are actually going to reduce it. We might just, thank you for that. We might just move on to microphone four down here, please. Hi, my question's for Naomi. Um, I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on, given that ExxonMobil has been criminally investigated at the moment for a climate cover-up, how you think that's gonna play out in um, building public pressure on governments to get to some emergency action on climate change? Yeah, that's a great question and um I've been in communication with the Attorney General's office in New York, and when they called me a couple of weeks ago, I said, what took you so long? <laughs> um, I think a lot of us close to this issue have, you know, we've known for a long time that ExxonMobil has funded tremendous amounts of disinformation, and there's always, I think it's been clear to many people for a long time that what they've done is clearly immoral, and it may be illegal. And I think the fact that Again, this gets back to the idea that government operates on a lot of levels. It's clear the federal government is not going to lead on this, but we now have um, attorneys, state attorneys, all across the United States who are looking into ExxonMobil and other companies as well. Um, if Peabody Coal hadn't just declared that they're about to go bankrupt, they would be being investigated as well. So I think we're going to see mounting pressure, and I think it's part of, it gets back to the sea change in terms of how we think about things. I think increasingly we're seeing citizens saying that it's not really all right for a corporation to be pursuing a business plan that is going to destroy the possibility of a prosperous and healthy future for us all. And to say that that's okay because they return value to shareholders is really a deranged idea. <laughs> and, and I think people are beginning to get that. And, and, and it's not just people outside of ExxonMobil, it's shareholders themselves. So there have been numerous shareholder resolutions um, from Exxon's own shareholders 
that the Exxon Mobil executives have continuously tried to suppress, repress, dismiss, and that's changing now too. Um, and part of the New York State Attorney General's um, investigation is the question of whether or not Exxon Mobil may have violated securities uh, law by not responding to shareholders' concerns and not fully communicating to shareholders uh, what risk is involved. I mean, one of the ironies of this, of course, it's one of the ironies of capitalism as it's practiced today is that, you know, you can totally uh, lie to your consumers and that doesn't seem to be a problem, but if you lie to your shareholders, well, that's a whole different thing. <laughs> so. We're going to take another question from microphone four because it took us so long to get around to you. Please go ahead. Um, I was just wondering what your opinion is on how to um, how to prevent um, vegan. Um, okay. Go ahead. No, no. Go Ta ahead. Take a moment. It's yeah. fine. We'll go to the next question from microphone four. Thank you. I have a question for each of the panel members. So a lot of people in this room are basically your change agents, and we need to create a tipping point. So what would your one action be for each of us in this room following this? Great question. <laughs> one action. Well, I think it depends who you are and where you are. I mean, diff each of us has, have different capacities. We all have different talents. The three of us have worked in different ways on this you know, same issue, but different approaches. And so depending on your talents and where you are in the world, who you know and who you can reach out to. I mean, if you are a farmer, you could be reaching out to fellow farmers to talk about those better farming practices. And if you're an educator, you could be talking to young people. If you're a high school teacher, you could be talking to those teenagers and taking them on field trips out in the woods or the bush. You don't have woods in Australia. <laughs> um, you know, or if you're a shareholder in a corporation, you could be participating in those shareholders' resolutions. Or if you're a lawyer, you could be working with Earth Justice and other organizations that are bringing all kinds of interesting and diverse legal actions against fossil fuel companies. So I, I don't think there's a one-size-fits-all answer, and I think this is part of the grounds for hope. Each one of us has the capacity to make a difference in different ways, but I can't tell you what well, I mean, if we sat down and had a beer together, I could. But I mean, you know, not knowing you, I can't tell you what the one thing is that you should do. But I know there's something you can do, and that is true for every single person in this room. Can, can I just add one little thing to that? Um, when I wrote The Weather Makers, it was read by a, a number of people about your age at the time. Um, one of them was a young woman going to university and she was so outraged at the lack of action on climate change um, that she just said, look, I'm going to do something. I'm going to found a, a new organisation to try to deal with this. It started off as nothing. It was called the Australian Youth Climate Coalition. It now has 80,000 members. Um, so it is extraordinary what just ordinary people can do. So, I mean, I, I agree with what Naomi says, but I, above all, I think get involved with other people, join a group, become part of a movement to change things in whichever area you feel most passionate about. There are, there are, there are all kinds of books out on ways to save the planet or 10 easy ways. There, there, aren't, there aren't 10 easy ways. I mean, it's going to take hundreds and hundreds of, of ways and, mm -hmm. and uh, we all have to decide which ones we're capable of uh, of doing, but I do advise young people to, if you can't vote, you've got to convince the two people, the most important people on the planet, that your mom and dad, to become eco-warriors on your behalf. That's a really important thing you have to do. And, uh, you know, and I have young people that say, well, my dad wouldn't, he doesn't believe in all this stuff. Well, if you can't convince your father who cares about you and thinks ahead, then how the hell are we going to convince the whole world? So I think mom and dad are very important. Some young people now in the United States, because Americans are very litigious anyway, are now suing their, their government for not looking out. And they've, they've won in the courts, oh, which yeah. is Our a children's remarkable trust. approach. Yeah, I mean, if you're interested in youth mobilization, one of the most amazing things going on in the United States right now is our Children's Trust, 
which is led by a group of young people with the support of an amazing lawyer, uh, Mary Christina Wood, and they have had several wins in state courts now, basically saying that the government has an ob obligation under the legal trust doc doctrine to protect air and water for future generations. And this is a very bold move, and when they started this work, People laughed at them, people said, there's no way. And they even brought suit in Texas, and people thought, okay, now we really know you're crazy. And they've won a very, very significant uh, win on the state level in Texas. Uh, so a lot of interesting things are happening led by young people. And you know what Bob Dylan says about the old folks, if you can't lend a hand, you know, then get out of the way. <laughs> so you either recruit your parents or you tell them that it's your turn. <laughs> We've run out of time, but I want us to think uh, as we leave, I want us to go out of here with a moment of optimism. Um, and I want to ask David to tell us a little bit about the Blue Dot initiative and the tremendous success about that. I mean, it goes to our question about here about, and to, to what Naomi said about rights to clean air, clean soil. Um, but t tell us a little bit about it and how it's being taken up. Well, the uh, Blue Dot Movement is, uh, we called it the Blue Dot Movement, uh, after Carl Sagan's uh, famous essay in which uh, Voyager 1, a satellite, was right at the outer edge of our solar system. It was a billion kilometers away. And Carl said, turn the satellite around and film uh, Earth. And what you get is this picture, basically it's all black with, with dots that are our galaxies, but in one-fifth of one pixel, pixel being the smallest uh, unit there, one-fifth of one pixel is this little blue dot, and that's our home. And he wrote this very moving essay that all of the history of, of, of our species took place in that little blue dot and think of the oceans of blood that were shed by, by people trying to gain a little foothold in one little corner of that blue dot. And so, uh, and he talks about how we, we have to protect each other and protect that blue dot. And so we started a movement. You know, the problem in Canada is that uh, if say you're being polluted by a, a, a coal-burning plant or something, we have to then marshal the evidence and, and prove that that company is jeopardizing our health in some way. Uh, there are more than 100 countries in the world that have uh, constitutional protection of your health, uh, protected in, in their constitution. And so we thought we need a constitutional amendment and enshrine, say that every Canadian has the right to expect a healthy environment that is clean air, clean water, clean soil, and so on. And so we, uh, we started 18 months ago. Uh, we decided to do a cross-Canada tour in a bus, solar, a solar bus, solar-driven bus. And uh, we stopped in 23 communities. We recruited indigenous people in every single community who jumped on the idea immediately. They understood what the significance of this was. And in each community, we, we, had, all, we had the National Ballet in Winnipeg that composed a specific uh, ballet which they performed at, at our event. We had Neil Young came to, who's a Canadian, you probably know him, he's a Canadian, came, <laughs> came and uh, performed Margaret Atwood, one of our renowned authors, came and read a poem that she had written. We had these events right across the country and uh, over six weeks. And I thought if we could get one municipality, now the way we do this is we have to get six provinces, seven provinces out of 10, that have a total of more than 50% of the population of Canada in those seven provinces, uh, supporting the idea of a constitutional amendment. And then we can go to the federal government and, and demand that it be done. And the way we did it was we're gonna recruit grassroots people Volunteers are going to work for us in their communities and uh, get their local municipality to pass a resolution supporting the, uh, the, the Blue Dot concept of a, a right to a healthy environment. 
I thought if we could get one community to do it within six months after we'd started the, the tour, that that would be the beginning of a grassroots movement. Three weeks after we started the tour, uh, we got our first community. And by the time the tour ended, we had six communities that had signed on. And one of the inspiring ones was a little community of 10,000 people in northern Manitoba where a grade six teacher saw the video we had prepared for this, uh, for this movement. She was inspired, showed it to her grade six class, and they got all excited and invited the mayor of this town to come and look at it. And the mayor said, oh, that's interesting. Bring it to city council. They did, and the council unanimously passed the right to a healthy environment. So, uh, we now, Vancouver, uh, Toronto, Montreal, Halifax, uh, all of our big cities, uh, as well as small communities, and in the north, Yellowknife and Whitehorse, have all passed the uh, right to a healthy environment. We now have 120, probably more by now, because every day we seem to add, 120 communities when I was there uh, last that have signed our right to a healthy environment. That's one out of every three Canadians now lives in a city or municipality that supports the right to a healthy environment. And one province, Manitoba, has now passed legislation for a right to a healthy environment. So we're on our way in only 18 months, and it's been very, very uplifting. We've got uh, 20,000 volunteers essentially working in every municipality in the country now, trying to get their local uh, community to adopt it. So this is, I think, real grassroots. And if we can get it passed at the federal level, it means that any development, any company has to prove that they're not in any way compromising our healthy environment. So it reverses responsibility completely. <laughs> Got to do it in Australia. Thank you so much to our speakers tonight. Naomi Oreskes, David Suzuki, Tim Flannery.